Good afternoon, everyone. I think we'd get start started. So I hope. So this is the last parallel session slot of our this one and a half day conference. I hope you had a very nice time here. So the objective of this this specific session is to offer some advices for uh, mobile researcher. Because you know if you're a MSCA fellow, you go or you travel uh, from different country to different country. So what happens with your career? Would you take, where do you start your career? Would you do at the country you moved in or your home country? So uh, we have four, or four different organization who would try to help you on this. So the first is the Net for Mobility Plus. So I, th I hope you all know that there are national contact points who are there to support uh, for your Mary Skorolska Korea Actions pro project proposal or even ERC project proposals. And then we have the Euraxis. Uh, Euraxis would give you more advice on career development. Uh, they have actually a very nice tool how you could use that tool for your career development. And th third, we have a um, speaker from Cost Action. Uh, so he will talk about, as a mobile researcher, how you can actually collaborate with a similar-minded researcher on a specific topic and can get funding for conferences or even uh, short-time scientific missions. So he will explain later on. Uh, then we, ha our last project is basically a project uh, of uh, a joint project between Kazi and American Korea Alumni Association. So I, I see that Bala and Sophia is here, who was responsible for this project from MCA part. And the CEO of Kazi will also be here. So the main objective of that part is to uh, find out the expectation gap between the employers and employee. So you will, you will see the uh, short survey result, which we got from uh, researchers from all around the world. So I would just give you a very short introduction. Our first speaker would be Yasmin. She is at the National, Con uh, National Contact Point support team and in Austria. Uh, and then it would be uh, Christina from uh, uh, Spanish National Contact Point, and then it would be Yulva again from, uh, okay, uh, <laughs> Victoria from Euraxis Worldwide. Those who doesn't know, Victoria also helped us a lot to set up our uh, US chapter. She is actually, Euraxis Worldwide is our uh, honorary member. And then it would be Yulva Huber from ERC National Contact Point in Austria. After that, it would be Elwin from Cost Action and Bala and uh, Nicolas from Kasi and MCAA. So, Christina, if you could kindly come. Uh, just one thing, you need to actually have the mic, uh, you, you need to talk at that part. So, the action <coughs> should happen there. Okay. Yeah. And, and this is the yes. yes. Perfect. Hello. I have to stand here, but there's chairs. Do you hear me? Does this work? Yes. Okay. So hello, everyone. I have a very short um, presentation um, just to show you the services the National Contact Points uh, can offer you. Um, so this is the wrong talk. Um, <coughs> um, but, but actually, so because we were starting with <coughs> the services of the national contact points. But actually, you have everything you need just before we open my talk in this nice uh, flyer, which is the flyer of our project, the Net for Mobility project. And it's the network of national contact points for the uh, Marie Skodowska Curie actions. So, uh, what are the national contact points? They're um, <coughs> located in Europe and um, other countries, third countries. Um, and um, they support you with your application for Marie Skodowska Curie Actions. So actually there's contact points for um, all the programs in Horizon 2020. Uh, we focus on Marie Skodowska Curie here, of course. And um, so they're the people to contact um, when you're thinking about um, writing a proposal for Marie Curie, when you're actually, um, thank you. <laughs> um, so I already talked about this, so we are really uh, in Europe and, and beyond. Um, so um, it's about really planning, um, then really writing the proposal, and also during the implementation phase. Okay, and the national contact points 
are, um, <coughs> are based in national institutions. So we have a Europe-wide network and we get information for, from the European Commission. And also our project is financed by the EC, but we're based in national institutions, um, funding agencies, um, research institutions and so on. And so our services vary from country to country. Usually, uh, so in all the countries, it's it information about the calls, um, what's new uh, every year, also advice on project planning, on, on the actual submission on um, and implementation. And some of the national contact points also offer proposal checks. So this is a really, really uh, useful service, which I would advise you to um, profit from. Um, so you can send them your proposal and they give you um, advice. And also training, sometimes uh, also um, strategic is issues and so on. And um, so if you're, a, um, if you're a fellow, please check out the contact uh, for the country you want to go to. Um, in, uh, so I have two websites, either uh, on the um, website of the European Commission or also on the website of uh, the Net for Mobility Plus project. You can find all the important contacts, even with a map. And um, the project I mentioned, uh, funded by the European Con Commission, and it's a project among the NCPs to learn from each other, to exchange experience, to make our uh, services to you uh, even better. And um, we provide information, so on the website of the project you can find uh, leaflets, um, success stories, uh, actually quite nice videos, uh, and you can also follow us in a couple of social media. And uh, of course, as I mentioned, there's support for your uh, project submission. Um, we collect expressions of interest, so sometimes it's quite hard to find uh, host institutions or um, <coughs> researchers for so to match the right people. So you can find expressions of interest of organizations and of fellows uh, on, on our website. Um, there's call-specific handbooks on every call, or really with... Um, so even in addition to the documents by the European Commission, really collected knowledge of the NCPs, what you should do when writing the proposals. Um, there's a blog on FAQs, which is very um, good. And um, so this is yet to come, also webinars on our website on, on different topics. Okay, so that was already um, my presentations. Please don't forget your flyer <laughs> when you leave the rooms and uh, just profit from the services of the national contact points. Okay, thank you. So, do you know what my presentation is? Or should I? Hello, my name is Cristina. I'm national contact for point for Marie Sclodowska Career Actions in Spain. And I'm going to talk to you about one specific task, which is within the work... Pro the um, is it? Okay. And, um, okay. So, congratulations everybody for being here. We are the survivors. Last session. <laughs> Here, it's here. Okay, so I guess we are all familiar with work packages, tasks. We are going to talk about the promotion and external networking for our project and about the last task, which is collaboration with researchers' networks. This is the one task that, that in Spain we are responsible for. So, the main aim of this task was establishing and structured dialogue between NCPs and MCAA and other scientific diaspora networks. Why? Because this is the main program in Horizon 2020 supporting researchers' mobility. So we wanted to be in contact with our main clients. So we, the, uh, the objective was to get in touch with you and to know what you knew about us and know your opinions and also, of course, to promote the Marie Curie actions farther than our borders. So, actions. We get in touch with MCAA, with several members from the national chapters, with Mostafa, with other members of the governing board, and uh, we identified some scientific diaspora networks. For me in Spain it was quite easy because there are 
15, I think, associations of Spanish researchers abroad established. So uh, coming out of this model, it was quite easy for me to find another scientific diasporas. And finally, with them, we prepared a survey. This survey was uh, addressing uh, uh, mobile researchers. We wanted to establish this first contact and also to know your opinions and what you knew about us that was very important. And finally, analyzing the results, we wanted to strengthen our services and also to gather some new suggestions to, to improve them and also to bring them to the European Commission so they know what researchers feel about Maria Sklodowska Curie actions. We had the support of some of these diaspora, also Vicky from your access links, <laughs> uh, North America, and it was structured in, seven, in five sections that we will talk about. But first of all, we needed to make a presentation. So we need to start with the presentation of the survey. What is Net for Mobility Plus? You know now because Jasmine told you, but we find out that not many of the researchers knew what Net for Mobility Plus was. Uh, and we said what, was, what were our services, promoting and giving support to applicants and beneficiaries. I mean, we help you to prepare your applications and we help you to implement your actions. And then we wanted to know your opinions. So we have the first part of the section, I'm trying, yes of the survey was classification of the respondents. We had 75% of European researchers and almost 80% of them mobile within European countries, which is quite good, but we wanted to know if there were uh, different needs from those researchers out of Europe. So we were supposed to have this survey for three months until October, we got these 131 respondents, which was quite good, but we wanted more answers, so it's now still open so that we can have more answers from non-European researchers or researchers out of Europe, and also as an open channel of communication with every Marie Curie Fellow. As you see, 80% of our respondents were already Marie Curie Fellows, but when we ask them about their knowledge of Marie Curie actions, 75% didn't know what an NCP was. Of course, that was surprising for us, and we really need to have a better reach out strategy. And also asking about the five types of actions, most of them they know about individual fellowships, about the researcher's night, about ITN, but RISE and COFAND were not so known. So. I would like to say here that maybe if you are an individual fellow, it's not, you cannot now join a RISE or a fund, but it's a next step in your career, and it's an interesting opportunity for your supervisors, maybe. A few weeks ago, I met a fellow who had just come back from his two years in the in United States, I think, he came back, he was now, he was now hired by, by a Spanish institution, and he applied for a rise in order to maintain this contact with researchers in the United States and with all his network. So this is an interesting opportunity for you after your fellowship or for your supervisors. Regarding COFAND, after joining your maybe ITN or I, IF, you can apply for a COFAND program. Do you know what COFAND programs are? Are you familiar with them? Okay, the important thing about them is that you need to find out which institutions have a COFAND program in your countries and then apply for that call. The way to do that is through the Your Access Jobs portal. And again, it's a new opportunity in your career, so it's interesting that you know about COFAND. Also, you can ask your supervisor to prepare a COFAND program so you can recruit more researchers for your group or for your area of, of research. We also wanted to know where we should promote our services, so we find out that you prefer direct emailing, which is quite a problem with this protection of personal data, but we will try to find ways to do so and the rest of them, the other channels, were quite well valued. Regarding uh, resources, 6% uh, 
new net permeability plus again very bad result but we are working on it quite good for our access and well other resources that is good to know where we could put some information about our network opinion on our services was quite good and regarding the evaluation of our most common services, as Jasmine said, it's not the same services in every country, but these are our most common activities. And the one best valued was training sessions. You want training sessions about how to write a propos proposal, more than informative sessions. And also a good result came out for the analysis of evaluation seminar reports. This material and practical guidelines on how to apply for different um, calls in Marie Curie are provided through our website in Net for Mobility Plus. And these are different suggestions that we got. For example, the first one, more flexibility to manage our funding resources. Well, that has nothing to do with our services, but we are happy to share them with the commission so that they know your feelings about the uh, Maria Scleroscopic reactions. Another ones like we prefer training sessions are for us. And the one in the center, I didn't know if I should contact NCPs. It was not clear what is their role and who they are. So Net for Mobility Plus. These are our functions, and down there where you can find us. It's all in our website. So please promote this website to all your friends so they know how to apply for Mercury actions. Uh, so how do we support researchers' mobility? Guide, guiding you through the five actions Mercury, which is the main program supporting researchers' mobility. And finally, we will be very happy to receive your feedback, so please fulfill the survey and share it with your colleagues. Thank you. Thanks, guys. So are there any questions for net for mobility? Any questions from the audience? Mustafa. Uh, was there any guideline from the Net for Mobility Plus how to <laughs> Sorry. Uh, was there any guideline for from Net for Mobility Plus uh, which can be distributed among the institutes? Because w what you said is that, yes, that's true, because even our member, when we say that, uh, please contact an NCP, they actually don't know what his NCP is. Fortunately for Spain and, and other countries, there is Net for Mobility Plus, but if I understand correctly, not every national contact point is part of Net for Mobility Plus. So. Ah, okay. okay. So basically what I'm asking, so just to rephrase, if there is one website wha where people can see, okay, they are the na national contact point for this country and this country. The, there is the European side, of course. And also in our website, there is a section for contacts. Okay, okay, contacts. okay. The thing is, another common comment on the survey was that the information was quite segmented and mm -hmm. very different websites. So what we are going to try to do is that MCAA has a banner to uh, link in to our website. We will do the same. <laughs> so uh, uh, the information was quite fragmented. You can find information in the European Commission website, also in our website, in MCAA website. So the idea is to share links from one web to another so you can get all the information about Marie Curie quite easily. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming and joining our last session of the day. 
Well, I'm not the last speaker, so please don't leave after I stop talking, because my colleagues would probably kill me for that. But anyhow, so um, if I still want to go back to the US ever, maybe not. Let's see. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about your access, uh, what it does, uh, what's in it for you, uh, why you should be interested, and uh, what kind of services we are offering, because they're all free, uh, you don't have to pay for anything. So that's one of the perks, one of the good things of uh, using the website. How many of you have heard of your access? Oh my gosh, this is wonderful, I don't even need to be here. <laughs> Okay, um, so yeah, bear with me. I'll probably repeat a couple of things. So anyhow, so uh, just kind of the formal explanation. So whenever I finish, then you know exactly what you need to say when they ask you to go and present your access uh, wherever you come from. It is a European Commission's funded uh, initiative or launched initiative. We started it back in 2004. The name Euraxis comes from the combination of access to Europe. So that's basically how we branded ourselves because this is not a funding program. This is not something where, you know, you will come to me and then you say, oh, I 100,000 euros. So I'm not going to write a check for you, unfortunately, but I can tell you where to find funding. So that's sometimes more valuable than actual the actual money. So uh, your access is supposed to be something like a one-stop shop for researchers and their family members as well uh, in order to relocate from one uh, place to another, uh, to give you information about the practicalities of the country that you are moving to, especially if you are moving to a country where you have not been before and um, you want to know about the taxes, about the social security, about the healthcare, where your children can go to school, where your spouse can work. So all of these information and much more, the Euraxis people, the Euraxis portal, the Euraxis website can help you with. And uh, I will show you uh, on the next slide a little bit about how the website looks like and where you can actually find the information. We are currently um, in Europe as well as outside Europe. Uh, in Europe, we are covering basically, I think, every single European country uh, within the European research area. So it's not only the EU, but also the so-called associated countries. So you can find us any, everywhere. And then we are also present in seven non-European locations. And I'm also going to show you where uh, we are. But really the aim of your access is uh, providing information and also helping you with your career development, helping you find your perhaps next step or helping you find the website helping you guide uh, towards the right direction uh, if you're a little bit lost and um, you need help where you would like to go next. I don't have a very long presentation, so I'm not going to go into too much of the details, but I wanted to let you know what you can find on the website, which is basically the most important tool that we have. Um, the parts on the on this slide are basically the buttons um, or are, uh, are the different sections on the Euraxis website. So if you just go and Google Euraxis or you um, or you do Euraxis.org or you know whichever website you would like to use, this is what you will find on the landing page. So so we have obviously the jobs and the funding, which is the most popular part of the website. Every day um, we have between 16 to 18,000 job vacancies available. So that's a very large number. The reason why we have so many is because we cover every single European country. We cover every single research field. So we go from social sciences uh, and humanities to life sciences and engineering. And also we cover different stages of your career. So the first that you can find on the website is basically our PhD positions. So if you are an undergrad looking for um, a doctoral training, you will be able to find those positions online. All the Marie Curie positions, be it a PhD or um, a fellowship, are uploaded on the Euraxis website as well. So you can use it as your, um, your one-stop uh, website. Then further up, you know, you will be able to find uh, positions for postdocs, for more experienced researchers, for research assistants. So anything that is basically connected to research science, innovation and technology in different European countries, in academia as well as industry. The industry is not um, as wide as the academic positions. 
Um, I would say about what well, will be the percentage, maybe 80 to 20 percent um, to from academia to industry. Uh, maybe it has changed, but I think that was uh, probably that that would be something that you could you could find on the website. So, um, but whenever it is through, uh, it is an industrial position, then it would say it's by an SME or it's by a company. So basically, you will uh, you will be able to see if it's uh, based at the university or uh, a private institution. Um, you can go online and search by keywords, by your career stage, by the country that you would like to go to, um, by an organization if you have something in mind. So there are a lot of different uh, possibilities to search the website without you having to register. But you can, and you can create your researcher profile. Because if you do, then there are some other perks. For example, the partnering tool and hosting, that's something that you can access if you are registered. So uh, the hosting is for, um, are you going to talk about that, the hosting? Okay, perfect, okay. Oh, okay, good. So I'm just gonna say a word about that. So the hosting part, if you see it on the website, it is uh, mainly giving the opportunity to universities that would like to host, especially the Marie Curie Fellows. So we give them that platform to place their um, expressions of interest on the website, and then you can see which universities are interested in hosting you. So that will be especially for them, and then for you to look at the places where you could go. And the partnering tool, um, it's especially for those that, um, I, I mean, I, I usually say that to um, the research community in North America, that if you don't really know anyone yet in Europe and you have not really connected um, with any, um, any researchers, any organizations, so that can be one of the tools that you can use to start searching and to start looking into um, who could be your peers uh, when you want to um, have a project or you want to come to Europe and uh, you are a little bit lost. So this could be sort of a starting point for you. Uh, the career development is an amazing tool, you guys, so you will hear it uh, a little bit later, so I'll skip that. Um, then we have the information and assistance, uh, which is basically all those wonderful people that are based at the Euraccess uh, centers across Europe. And um, I used to be uh, working in one of them, uh, and I have one of the best experiences and memories from back there because we helped so many researchers, especially non-Europeans, um, come to the country. I was at the time in Prague and I was uh, responsible for the, for the Czech uh, national network. And we had researchers from India, from Russia, from Ukraine, Japan, US, Canada, you name it. And they all needed visas, they all needed work permits, they all needed long-term uh, permits. And we were basically the ones who help them go through the process. So it was much faster. Um, I think it was a lot more enjoyable than going through the process by themselves. So um, we fought, or even I personally with the ministries, I'm like, we are going to have a special line for my researchers at the foreign police. And they're like, no, 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 <laughs> that's not gonna work. And I'm like, okay, so I left. And then the next day I came back and I knocked again. I'm like, hi, it's me again. <laughs> so I did it a couple of times until they got um, sick and tired of me and they told me, okay, fine, <laughs> here's your line. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I, I put it into into sort of on a uh, on a on a comic um, version, but it really helped um, a lot. Um, I could say that the difference between them trying to get the visa themselves um, and us helping was almost three months. And that's a very long time for in a life of not only a researcher, but everyone. And of course, if you come with a family, if you come with your spouse, with the children, and you know, they also need to kind of come along with you. You know, you cannot say, oh, your visa will be ready in six months, so you stay home and I go. Sometimes you kind of need that support to go with you along and you don't want to wait too long. But yeah, if you want to hear others' personal stories, I'll be happy to share. Anyhow, so please use uh, the information that is provided. There's a lot on the website, and uh, there, there are people behind the websites, and they're very helpful, and they can help you with anything you could possibly think about when you're moving from one country to another. Um, so it's definitely very, very useful. Every country, <coughs> 
has their own Euraxis website. So there is like Euraxis Austria, there is Euraxis Poland, there is Euraxis Croatia, Euraxis the Netherlands. So every country has their own personalized website where you can find a lot of information already um, posted. Last but not least, we have the Euraxis Worldwide. And as I said, that I will mention where we are outside of Europe. And I don't know if you see, it, can, uh, it might be a little um, small, but we are present in Southeast Asia, in China, India, Japan, South Korea, Latin America and the Caribbean and North America. So we have people in, 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 these, um, uh, in these locations that are also part of the larger Euraxis network. And I will tell you just in a bit what we do. But before I do that, um, I wanted to share some statistics about um, the portal because I think that, you know, some people have not really used it or they are not really familiar. Um, so I wanted to show you that we have almost 100,000 registered users on the Euraxis um, uh, website, of whom 50% are researchers. Research uh, institutions can also register because obviously they upload their vacancies, they upload um, the, the jobs and the funding that is made available to you. Um, see, 60,000 job vacancies published annually. And as I mentioned, um, actually the number I put, I think two days ago, it was 19,000 research positions available. It's huge. Like t I remember, you know, 15 years ago, we started with 100. So it has grown a lot. We also expanded to having funding offers, which we didn't have before, and um, also the, um, the hosting offers that uh, I mentioned to you on the previous slide. Oh yeah, I do have video. Can we play it, please? Someone else as well. Oh. Okay. No, no, no. It's um. Uh, yeah. Can we go to your presentation again? Yeah, yeah. But where was it? Here. Uh. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know what the circle was about. It's just anyhow. Perfect. So if any of you will perhaps one day still use the Global Fellowship, then uh, you can 
um, you can be stay assured that if you come to one of our Euro Access Worldwide countries, we'll be happy to connect with you, or connect with us, and uh, we'll be happy to have you on board. There's a, there's a Marie Curie North America chapter, um, which we collaborate with uh, on the on a regular basis, which is really really good. We organize events together, info days. We go out to different universities, different research institutions, and we talk about the Marie Curie actions, the European Research Council grants, the different other funding opportunities that uh, basically the member states offer from their national funding. So not only on the European level, but also on the national level. Um, unfortunately, we don't have an NCP in North America, which we lack tremendously. So I am like a tiny little NCP uh, over there. Um, they should pay me, you know, now that I'm thinking about that. <laughs> But um, so we don't, so we spread the word. Uh, we are only two of us, uh, well, one and a half. My colleague only works part time. Um, so we are there spreading the word about uh, how wonderful Europe is um, and everything else you saw in the video. So I'm not even going to repeat myself, but feel free to reach out to us. If someone is planning to come to the US or Canada, then uh, we have the network uh, of the, as I mentioned, the Marie Curie fellows who can help also with some administration um, and some visa issues perhaps, because we don't do the same thing as my colleagues do here in Europe. So we inform about funding in Europe because we don't have the personnel to do all the administration or all the other things, unfortunately. So uh, by having said that, this is uh, how our website looks like. We post a lot of different opportunities on it. You can sign up if you want to receive our newsletters or our flash notes that are on the monthly basis. And um, I also always add a couple of links uh, so you can, you can kind of go and browse yourself. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you for being here. And I will pass on the microphone to, uh, to Lil. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I will seek to follow up this, I think, excellent um, overview on the activities of your access by briefly taking a glimpse into a relatively new section. I'm, I'm trying to speak into it. Hmm. I'm trying. <laughs> okay. is, it, is it working? Or Okay, that's better. <laughs> Close? Okay. I'm scared of the previous microphone, which was so loud, so I try. So I would just like to follow up briefly with zooming in on one of the sections that is relatively new, the career development section, just to give you a flavor of what you can find there. Um, and I think it fits very well into many of the discussions we had regarding also thinking early, having an open mind for career possibilities beyond academia. By the way, to briefly introduce myself, I'm unfortunately not Lil Reif, uh, my colleague cannot <laughs> be here uh, today. Um, so I'm stepping in besides being ERC national contact point, I'm one of the Euraxis contact point at, at the Austrian contact points at the Austrian uh, Research Promotion Agency. And we have actually also been involved in one project that was looking particularly at um, career opportunities in business, so beyond academia. But And that was one of the projects that fed into the section. Somehow, I don't think I'm doing well with this mic, but <laughs> I'm trying. Um, so the idea is really to have a couple of resources on one hand, information on the opportunities as such, but also sharing experience. What have researchers done? Where did they go? How happy are they now? And the statistics actually show that they are very happy. Even at the beginning, maybe they wouldn't even want to consider a career outside. And this is certainly also a matter of uh, changing perceptions and, and a certain openness. And of course, this is just a website. It's, I think it's a very useful collection of tools, but it is also, I think, helpful in guiding with whom could you talk, what opportunities are out there. So hopefully supporting the job that ideally mentors, career uh, advisors uh, will, will do. Um, unfortunately, the, the font size is not very, <laughs> very big, but um, one of these sharing experiences is really showing 
showing the full spectrums of what researchers have been doing after their academic career or maybe as an intermission coming back afterwards. So ranging from the agricultural sector to the manufacturing um, sector and you will always have um, experience reports but also information on the needs of this sector, on the, on the prerequisites to really thrive there. And one of these, um, and I mean there are many surveys, and I think we will hear <laughs> an additional survey uh, today, which will be very interesting. Um, so that was one of the uh, surveys asking really those researchers represented in this section in what business sector do they work or does their employer work? And it's really very broad. So uh, business in this case, it includes also education. So it's not completely sharp in the definition, but you see charity sector, management, consultancy, uh, companies, uh, and you get the flavor of, of what what is the, um, the distribution right now. And that is um, something we will see if it matches <laughs> with, the, with the survey we will hear later. Um, this is actually meant to give a very positive note on a quite good matching between what researchers think they are good at and what employers want to see also want, uh, what are the needs of employers, what they need from, from their employees. And it's quite a similar list. And I'm curious because so many surveys have been done. Maybe, maybe another survey will show some discrepancy, but overall, I think this is an encouraging message. And we hear it also in workshops with industrial employers that they actually like researchers for what they are. They shouldn't be surrogate managers and so on. It's, it's good to have translatable sk and transferable skills, but really the way of thinking, the critical thinking, the problem solving approach is something that is very much valued and, and, and should be, uh, so to speak, cultivated. And this is just um, one, one of the more maybe facts and surveys uh, kind of information you will find on this uh, section. Uh, then labor market information really going more into depth on certain sectors. What is the labor market situation now? what are the key prerequisites, what is, are the key skills that, that are expected, what are maybe challenges also in this sector. So these are um, yeah, kind of collection of experiences and then there is also a section with videos, really researchers telling their career stories, how they embarked on their new career, what their experiences are and I think this is a very nice section. We will hope it will be populated with <laughs> more and more videos eventually. Yes, then there is a specific section going on, uh, f focusing really on engaging with business, with industry, um, both on this, uh, on the, from the perspective of researchers, but also in a more structural sense, encouraging organizations, how they can reach out, how they can shape framework conditions for researchers to come in easier, more easier into contact with the business sector and uh, many ways to do this, but uh, yeah, po possibilities to work there, short time secondments is one of the key roads uh, to success also in terms of uh, collaboration. All of this is also accompanied with I hope an ever-growing <laughs> number of training resources, but many um, EURACCESS projects, actually, uh, specific projects have been feeding into this. Pipers is an example, really collecting um, training kids, for example, helping you assessing your strength and, and but also uh, finding information where you can get mentoring. So uh, quite a number of tools, not all of them in the end are uh, free of cost. So this is more a signposting. Most of the resources are free of cost, but they're also links to professional advisors and they may in the end uh, charge, uh, charge costs. So but just that you have a good overview. And this is showing what it's covered. So um, inter for example, where working in an interdisciplinary context, which is very important also in the business sector, the openness, leadership skills, public engagement, how to make a spin-off company. And there is, of course, lots of information on that already around, but the idea was really to capture uh, key information on this. And I think the last slide is really, again, going a little bit on the higher level. This section is also meant to give an overview on what can in terms of research career development as a, in, as a general issue, what should be done to support yeah, a conducive framework to really help researchers to find their way 
through different uh, career paths. And uh, so besides the uh, well-known charter and code, there's really also the idea to collect uh, recommendations that can be implemented at national and at EU level. So this is a kind of a theoretical framework you also have on this page. And with that, I think, yes, I conclude and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Euraxis. Are there any questions for the Euraxis from the audience? Sure, you can shout. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a uh, question. So, in one of the slides, you showed uh, that uh, people can upload their CV on the website. So, it's like that. Then, employer can contact them directly based on their CV, or what's how it's working? Thank you. Any other questions? So I have a question to Victoria, actually. So you said in your presentation there are some funding options available from the Euraxis. So may I know what kind of funding and the researchers can apply for that? <laughs> Thank you. Were you listening to me? <laughs> <laughs> Right, right, right. You just heard the word funding and then you're automatically just like, yeah, she has funding for me. No, so Euraxis has always been and always, I think, will be really the platform to find funding. So it's either through the website that we already have the thousands and thousands of jobs. Um, and then we have the special section for funding opportunities. So that's new. That hasn't been part of it before. So you can search uh, for, for funding. Or then through us um, is basically what we put in to our, um, <laughs> I'm kind of trapped in here. <laughs> uh, what we put into our uh, flash notes, so we search different um, funding agencies and and research councils of the European countries, and then we you know we look at their funding opportunities and we say, oh, Denmark has you know 16 PhDs available so we put it into the our flash node and we send it out to you so it's mainly you know um, then if it's not the EU level uh, then the member state level through the different funding that we find to PhDs to postdocs sometimes visiting scholars sometimes uh, even summer schools um, so depending on on the opportunity and on the country and what they're offering so those would be the funding I think that yeah that's fine thank you very much I mean, uh, do you have any plan to include also Africa? Mm. Because I, I think Victoria has definitely answer for this. Yeah, please. Thank you for the question. And uh, if it was me, yes. If it was up to me, then uh, I would go tomorrow. Um, I think uh, we have done a um, uh, a survey. Uh, within the larger Euraxis network because it's not like, you know, you, you travel with your finger on the world map and you say, oh, you know, we want to go here because then we would be everywhere. Um, so it's mainly we have to do some kind of um, um, sort of a possibility survey or, or, or um, uh, questionnaires within the countries, seeing how many, for example, also European researchers are based or not based, whether people are interested in collaborating with European uh, partners, with European researchers. So there are a few questions in that in that survey that we want to, it's almost like a feasibility study, if you, if you will. So we have done that, and um, one of the African countries so far that came out uh, very positive is South Africa. Um, we have not yet done or we have not yet established, but we are planning to have the new contract as of next year, as of 2020. So we are all now excited to see if the commission is going to uh, introduce one of the countries in Africa. So we don't know yet. We are kind of waiting because it's almost like it's sort of it's long overdue, I think. It, uh, it should be there. Um, 
so this is sort of a long answer. So the short answer, not yet. <laughs> but um, the, the longer one is that we are hoping to have one there. Any other questions? I get out of my bench now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, active, um, you mean like where we go um, and present and um, mm, well we obviously they're the, the big universities that everyone know of and, um, and they're very well known and they're high ranking but our aim is to also go to smaller universities to inform um, these people, these students, these researchers what are the opportunities that Europe offers. So basically we don't have like a couple of universities that we work with. We basically um, try every year have a work plan and go to different universities across North America where we either haven't been because as you know, there are so many that even if I was working there for another 30 years, I don't think I will be able to visit all of them because it's so many. Um, so sometimes we go back to the big ones because they invite us and they want us to come back but um, our aim is to really spread the word across um, across the entire region so i don't i don't we don't have like a special collaboration with one or a couple of universities if that makes sense yeah <laughs> okay next speaker <laughs> thank you guys thank you Hello, um, so I'm Elwin. Uh, maybe you've already seen me uh, sitting at the stand, uh, which was just at the, the place where you always had your coffee. So I was just sitting opposite, so I've already bothered many of you with the story about cost. Um, but I will bother you a bit more now, but only for a very short period of time. So that's the good news. It's, it's nice weather, so probably some of you are already thinking of uh, of not being here anymore, but you will have to suffer me for a few minutes. Um, so basically, I'm going to talk about cost, and uh, I have a very short time here, so I will just be quick. Cost is a European program funding networks in science technology, so we don't fund research itself, we don't give fellowships or um, individual grants, but rather we give groups of researchers who work together on one topic a certain amount of money each year to basically fund networking events like meetings, workshops, conferences, etc. And I will, uh, these help a lot in research and mobility and I will focus a bit on the particular grants which allow you to do short-term research visits abroad in Europe. So basically, uh, we already exist for 45 years. We actually exist, uh, 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 we outlive any other uh, uh, um, funding uh, scheme in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Europe. So we're basically the, the oldest one. We already, we started in 1971 and currently we have 48 members, one cooperating country, and we even extend beyond the borders of Europe through our near neighbor countries. As you can see, they are North Africa, Middle East, and the Eastern Partnership countries, roughly. Um, so all these countries, they um, so basically participants from all these uh, uh, countries listed here are eligible to uh, get reimbursed for um, participating in cost activities. So from many countries, there are possibilities. Um, so what do we do? Well, basically we fund networks, which we call actions. Um, and uh, over the year 2017, uh, we are a bit slow, so we haven't yet the updated data for 2018. I should have, but um, that's uh, a work for tomorrow, I guess. So in total in 2017, there are uh, over 300 running actions. Currently, there are about, at the moment, so around to, to, um, between 200 and 250, and they're really on all kinds of topics. Really, the whole spectrum of topics is uh, covered, so it really goes from quantum physics to um, linguistics. So and, and the arts, so it's really every, uh, basically every topic imaginable is covered and there's some pretty cool uh, uh, topics out there, so I would just check the cost website, see if there's a network which really interests you, because then you can do many things. So these 
actions they uh, organize training schools. So every action, roughly like each year, they organize one. Sometimes they skip a year, but several training schools are going on each year. And uh, most important, uh, I can see if I can, I can point. So we have short-term scientific missions. So basically, as basically, it's, it's self-explanatory. So basically, you can, in the context of an action of a network apply to go to another uh, lab or research group in another country for maybe one week or one month or maximum three months to visit there to work together and for example to start a collaboration on the paper or maybe a proposal collaboration to share equipment to um, to basically to exchange experiences etc um, so there's general two thousand between over two thousand of these per year um, and I will tell a bit more about these um, um, just in a minute because these are, from my point of view, really the most important instrument of cost in the context of really research and mobility, what we're talking about here. So in total, the number, total number of research involved in cost actions in one way or another is around 45,000. So on average, a network incorporates 200 to 300 researchers, uh, either because they are in the management committee of an action, because they participate to a workshop, to the final conference. Well, in the end, so th the networks, they really expand. And if you get involved in a cost action, you will meet a lot of people, including those you might have not expected to meet, or those who are, for example, from a completely other discipline, but they, um, um, they work on the same topic. And no normally you would never have met them, but now, due to the cost action, you meet them, and maybe that's the beginning of a wonderful inter interdisciplinary collaboration. So, research on mobility. Basically, in the context of a cost action, you can apply to the action, of which there are more than 200, and say, look, I want in this year to do a short-term research visit to a lab in another European country, or even to a country beyond Europe, although that's not so often the case. Um, and basically, it's for any period between a few days and several months, it's really what fits you the best. If you only have a few days to spare, for example, you have teaching obligations, so you cannot go for longer than a week to another country, but also because you have, for example, personal obligations. We, most of us, we have, uh, uh, we have some kind of personal life, a family life, we have personal relationships, and sometimes it doesn't suit to be in another country for a long period. So it really su it's about what suits you the best, and you do the application, you steer how many days or how many weeks you want to go. Um, so uh, yes, as I sh already showed, there's more than 2,000 a year, so there are many uh, possibilities for funding. And just to I, I just checked the data last week, and of all the requests which go through our system, to the cost actions, 75% of the requests for these missions get granted. So there's a really a high success rate. So basically it says, if you have a good proposal, a well-funded proposal where, where it's, it's really clear what the advantage is of the mission, it's, I don't say it's sure that you get funded because then people will come back to me and complain, yes, but I had a very well-founded proposal and it got, didn't get granted by the, by the network, but there's a high chance you get the grant. Um, so basically there's only one requirement, each action country subscribe to, and your country has to be in the action. Now, especially for the larger countries, the, the larger countries are nearly in every action. Some smaller countries, especially the very small ones like Montenegro or Albania, they are in a bit less actions, but even those are often in, in, in many actions, including those ones which are really about the most salient topics. So that's really the only requirement here. So the administrative burden to start doing such an application is very low. The only thing you have to know is check the cost website, see if there's uh, an active network in your topic, and see if your country is in. And by the way, if your country isn't in, you can ask for your country to get in. So it's a bit more work, but even that is uh, uh, surmountable. So, and then, what are the outcomes and the results of these? So, there's more than 2,000 co-created publications reported per year, but it's only those reported. You know, nobody likes reporting publications, especially not to bureaucrats like me. So, often they get unreported, but even those who are actually taking the effort to report them, there's more than 2,000. And as you can see, there were also roughly more than 2,000 SCSM per year. So, you see that's roughly every SCSM leads to one publication. Some, of course, don't, and others lead to many. But on average, it, it leads to something. And it's also, it's a bit like uh, LinkedIn, but then far more interesting. So 
you don't have to make the big commitment when you do such a short-term mission. If you go there for two weeks and you don't get along with your local host, it's just two weeks, you know, after you, you go home and you forget about this person. It's not like you have to work with them for two years in a postdoc or something. But if it fits well, if it fits well, it can lead to something more substantial on the longer term. Like you can apply for, indeed, a postdoc or some kind of fellowship uh, later on. So it's a very good testing ground to see does this lab, does this research group, does it fit me well to be with them, to work with them, to, to, to start working here? Maybe even, you know, the city where you go, you know, uh, you go to the other side of Europe, maybe uh, you just first want to know, can I live there? Does the climate suit me? These kind of very important questions. Um, so it's really this, this first step and it's very, um, it's very easy to make this first step and it can lead to uh, many good uh, uh, results on the long term. And uh, yeah, so and that, that's basically what he has said. So basically, it's often about finding the right partners, but then academically spoken, not personally spoken, of course. So, and yes, it makes a change. So 84% uh, of participants in cost actions say participation enhances their career, and that's general participants. So also those who go to conferences, etc. Uh, I believe that for participants to SCSMs, which are really the short-term missions, which are really intensive, it's even higher. And 78% of participants said it led to new professional opportunities. And often it's exactly these opportunities, like new collaborations, uh, the possibility to jointly apply for a fellowship or maybe even for uh, an Horizon 2020 proposal. Um, so also in these cost actions, a bit more general, you can just apply for an individual grant and do the, the, the mobility, but you can also really get involved in managing the cost action, the leadership positions, uh, as we call them. And um, on average, every uh, year, 500 people, they basically graduate from these leadership positions, they fulfill them for four years, and then they are relieved from their burden, which often, or sometimes, people are very happy with, because then finally they can do research again, instead of research administration. But these m skills are increasingly important in research, that you're not only a brilliant mind, but also you can lead the team, you can uh, do successful proposals, you know how to get people together, how to fix collaborations, and these are the like the soft skills in uh, in academia, which are uh, or for which um, the cost actions are really a good school. So, apart from just applying for an individual grant for a research stay abroad, getting more intensively involved in cost actions can really help you, especially when you're earlier in your career, to get these skills. And often we have heard many stories that people said. I was a postdoc or I had not yet a tenured position, but because I was, for example, chair of vice chair or working group leader in a cost action, I got the recognition from the panels that I really had this management experience and that, this, that gave me a tenured position. So it's really worth thinking about. And finally, and uh, because we are at the Mercury Alumni Association here, I have to say something about MSCA. Um, we have a very high success rate in Horizon 2020. So uh, I will just come to the statistics on my last slide. So already at the penultimate slide for those who are already bored by my presentation. Um, so, um, um, so there's a very high success rate. Uh, 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 on average, one in four proposals spinning up from a cost action to Horizon 2020 is successful, while it's generally known that on average that's just one in 10. Because in cost actions you get to work with so many people, and all those people contribute to these proposals, they tend to be stronger and well, uh, more uh, well-founded, and that's recognized by the evaluators. Um, and in particular, uh, often cost actions are the staging ground for an ITN. So, uh, well, of course, I, I don't have to explain the ITN to, to this public, at least. But cost actions, they are very low, uh, low entry, etc. They are less intensive than ITN, but with more partners. And what you see is then that those partners in the cost actions who are most committed to collaborating, they keep collaborating, for example, from uh, an ITN, but we also see several MSCI RISE uh, grants spinning off from. I think that over 2018, it was 50 successful grants spinning off from cost action, so that's not so bad. Yes, and this is this is the numbers, they are also a bit old, uh, they should be updated uh, quickly, but um, this was for one year, there were 114 actions which had a final action report, they submitted amongst them 392 Horizon 2020 proposals, so that's over four per action, and of these, one uh, even here it's even one third was uh, um, successful, so that's not so bad at all. Well, I have to say, 
successful proposals get more reported than unsuccessful proposals. So the one third might be a bit an under, uh, overestimation, of course. But uh, I think this is the final slide, is it? Yes, very good, excellent. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question regarding the short-time scientific missions. So the young researchers, um, so uh, it's two parts question. First of all, who do they apply to? To the coordinator of the action or a, a cost board? So they apply to the action directly. So on the CAS website you can find all the actions and the contact. And oh, I, I need to use the mic apparently. So. On the COS website, you can find all the details about all the running cost actions and also, very importantly, the, um, where you have to go to get more information or to do an application. Now, often these cost actions, they have on their website a specific call, for example, for this mission. They say, at this point, you have to, basically, there's a deadline to apply for such a mission and then uh, you get it granted or not, of course. That's it's always the case. So it goes through the cost uh, actions, but through the cost website, you can find all the details about the relevant cost actions for you and who you have to go to in these actions to get more information to see, can I apply right now for a mission in the context of this action? Or maybe can I join there? Uh, annual conference with a poster or a short talk, or maybe I can join a summer school of this. Uh, that's now, I think, uh, getting very much in vogue. Uh, summer is coming, so the summer schools are also uh, are coming, especially in August, where a lot are organized in the context of cost actions. Um, you had another question? Yeah, so I was wondering, I guess. Oh, <laughs> um, thanks. So I guess for the application, you would have to show that your topic fits to the action, and uh, so there's also. Yes, yes. Well, oh. of, of course, like it's up to the action management ultimately to see like does it fit the action or not. But my experience is that in general, it's not that you have to be exactly on the topic. As soon as there is a, as long as there's like a, a reasonable connection between your topic and the topic of the action, they're actually happy also to have you in because it, the more diversity in the action also tends to make it stronger. So these networks tend to be pretty open to the participants. Uh, from other disciplines. So of course, if there's an action on uh, um, a quantum physics and then maybe you have a, a, um, a sort of scientific mission in economics, maybe they won't accept because maybe they see the link as rather, uh, rather uh, compli uh, complicated. But in general, given that there's so many actions, there's always maybe even m multiple actions which are really relevant to you. So there's a lot of choice out there. Thank you for your presentations. Um, I wanted to ask if there is any nationality restriction. No, there's no nationality restriction at all. The restriction is purely on country of affiliation. So, for example, for the uh, short-term scientific missions to be eligible, you have to be either in a cost member country or cost uh, cooperating state, which roughly covers all of Europe, or in a cost near neighbor country, so in North Africa, uh, the Middle East or the um, um, Eastern Partnership countries, so uh, Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, uh, the Caucasus. But there's no um, nationality restriction at all. So also people from, for example, even other continents working in Europe can fully apply for these uh, uh, grants. Of course, in some cases there's visa restrictions and you have to make sure that when you do the mission you have the right visa. That's, uh, but maybe your access can uh, help you with getting this fixed. So there is some uh, synergies here, I see. Um, yes. Yeah, well, it's, it's, um, so it's, uh, it's roughly the same. So basically funded, so to get reimbursed for your participation, you have to be from the list of countries, which I showed in the beginning. So the cost member countries, cooperating state, um, or near neighbor countries. However, other countries can, on the basis of mutual benefit, so basically all over the world, also join uh, the cost actions. However, they should do that normally on their own funds, but they can then still profit from the fact that the action is organizing the conferences and, uh, and training schools, etc. 
do uh, do I need to be formally associated with a university? So, for instance, uh, if my contract is ending as um, a doctoral postdoctoral researcher from Marie Curie, for instance, and uh, but I would like to join, for instance, next month. Uh, but I won't be formally associated with my home institution. Uh, does that um, limit me to participate? So do I need to be formally associated with a university or a position or whatever? So basically, in practice not. However, there's one limitation and that is cost doesn't research, uh, doesn't fund research. So of course, when you uh, join cost action activities, you can get your like uh, basically your uh, expenses reimbursed, but you don't get any salary for it. So of course, you still need somehow to provide for your own uh, uh, living allowance, so to say. So that's something cost cannot intervene in. Uh, so. What we see is uh, formally we ask from participants some kind of affiliation. However, sometimes when they ha don't have a current contract, they are, for example, visiting researcher, etc. And that's in practice fine. I mean, nobody's going to check that uh, uh, in, in general. Uh, so there's and by the way, it's not only researchers in universities, but also those in government, in business, in nonprofit associations who have an interest in the cost action topics who often join. Uh, they can get reimbursed, but they, especially in business, you often see that they do it on their own dime because it's so interesting to be involved in the cost actions. Any other questions? A very technical thing. What's the mechanics of the funding? I mean, uh, do you provide funding directly to the researcher? You refund the researcher? or you give money to the institution and the institution is providing money to the researcher? So basically, the cost association has like, basically funds the, uh, the, the cost actions, the networks who have a grant holder. So there's one institution which holds the grant. Um, so a central institution, not your own institution. Well, in general, not your own institution. Um, and this institution then reimburses the, um, the participants to the individual participants in the context of the uh, network. Uh, so, um, but you get the money on your own account, so to say. It's not your institution which gets the money for your participation. No. Yes. Okay, thank you everyone. So we're almost ready for the last talk in this session. Please bear, bear with us for a few more minutes. Okay, hi everyone. So actually this is a, a collaboration project between Marie Curie and uh, Kazi. Kazi is a startup company based in Antwerp, Belgium. So the main idea of this project is to bridge the expectation gap between PhD, postdocs, and the industries in the Flanders. So this is a Flemish regional government funded project. So what Flemish government want to see is like, how to attract and retain the talent in Flanders. And in this project, we mainly focused on four main uh, domains, like biology, biotechnology, chemistry, and materials. And, in, and on the other hand, we also contacted the same in the corporate side in the, these four domains. And one side, the researchers, mainly PhDs and postdocs who are living in Benelux and also in the globally, we contacted almost all the people. And for the corporate side, we only contacted the industries which are in the Flemish region in Belgium. So, yeah. 
Yeah, actually, this is a collaboration project, and MCAA side, we connected with the, all the uh, the members, and we gave the database. I mean, we in fact provided the survey to the members, and we opened a survey link on our website, and we sent the, our members asked to fill the survey. Of course, on the talent side, we have roughly about 65 questions where uh, after the, uh, once you finish the survey, it will get you a report like in which of the team leads you have the more strong things for the your access talking before. And on the other side, we also send the same survey to the corporate side and what they're looking in the, in the talent side. So we have some interesting numbers actually. So even I also don't know the numbers till today. So Nicholas is the CEO of Kazi. He's going to talk all the numbers in this survey now. So Nicholas. Stage is yours. Yes. It's just in time delivery. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Bala. Yeah, sure. No problem. Um, Good afternoon. Um, I'm founder and CEO of Kazi, which in Swahili uh, means job and mission. Because if it's your job, why else would you be doing it if you weren't predestined to do it, if you weren't enjoying it, if it wasn't your mission? Basically, what's the problem that, that we want to tackle? It's, it's a positive story. The war on talent is long over and talent has won. And they want to be catered to, um, aligned with their expectations. So basically, the MCAA and CASI, we teamed up to address the expectations gap between PhDs and postdocs and their employers, not on the hard side, not on the hard skills, because it's pretty obvious to talk about that. There is a single language, a single semantic to talk about that. But on the softer side, on the job content side, what do you like to do? Do you like to be a team player or an Einzelgänger? Do you like to be coached or find your way on your own? You like to follow procedures or be results driven? You like to be the creative guy in a team or a networker that connects resources with other teams? Why well, it's, it's a big problem right now because one in two PhDs and postdocs wants to switch jobs on the corporate level within the first year because of a mismatch in expectations from the start. And for employers, it's, a, it's, a, it's not just a human issue, it's also a money issue. For example, some of the clients that we work for tell us, yeah, it's, it's, it's double expensive because it's expensive to hire them, but if we lose them in the first year while we're still training them on the job, yeah, it's a double whammy. And I'm not even touching on the, the disengagement problem. So what we developed since 2014, together with the Thomas More Center for Psychodiagnostics, of the uh, Leuven University, who you probably uh, know. That's one of the premier universities, research-focused universities in, in Europe. We developed a new language that can be spoken very easily by both sides of the aisle, both the talent side, 10 minutes to fill out a very simple online multiple choice questionnaire, and five minutes on the job side, the hiring manager, the recruiter, the one who posts a job posting, very simple questions. I'll give you an example of, of one of them in a, in a second. And the question, uh, the, the language consists of 14 tags, 14 profiles, six work value tags. They're all about identifying key job content expectations. For example, I'll, I'll be yeah, full disclosure, no fake news today here. Uh, I'm a people person and I'm extremely results oriented. And I score very low on accurate. That means if you offer me a job where I can't talk or I can't be results oriented, find my own way to solve a problem, I will die, proverbially speaking. And if you want me to follow procedures day in, day out and work accurately, same goes. That's not something that, that, that if there's variation, okay, but some of those key things should be in the job content, in the task portfolio for what I'm doing if you want to make me happy. Same goes for the team roles. Right? We got eight team roles. The planner likes to plan what goal-oriented performance performers do. You got the creative guy 
who tries to solve problems in the now, while the visionary strategist more thinks about solving solutions longer term or in the abstract. You get the challenger, eh? challenging every team member, maximizing potential, the heli helicopter is more. The, the team leader, so to speak, the networker, that's one of my strongest team roles. I'm always on the lookout, I, I get bored very quickly, and I'm always on the lookout to connect the team with other resources in other teams to further both our causes. This, these are things that you can easily learn from taking the CASI test, 61 multiple choice questions on the talent side, 29 on the uh, job side. As an example of one question, then you see how easy and intuitive it is, and that's why it took us quite some time and a couple of years to develop it and get it academically validated from both sides, because it needed to be very simple. It couldn't be multi-interpretable, because everybody uses a different word to describe certain things in a job context. That's exactly the problem that we wanted to solve, so it had to be simple. So here you see, um, uh, a question with regards to planning autonomy for the ones in the back. Eh, for example, the, the top answer is, eh, the, the question is, mark the statement that describes the expectations for this job. Top answer is, in this job, tasks have to, be, have to be executed in a strict order. The employee has little or no choice as to the order. The tasks have to be executed. Four levels of answer. And the bottom is, tasks have no specific order. The employee can freely choose the order in which he or she executes the tasks. That maps to planning autonomy, and planning autonomy is part of ambition, the work value ambition. And we'll talk about that more because we'll, we'll delve into the interim results of the project, the research project we're doing right now, and some of the insights are striking. And remember the, eh, the planning autonomy, the ambition, etc. We'll talk about that later. So what came out for, for the ones who already performed it uh, was a, a self-scan. Uh, I'll, 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 for the ones who are in the room right now who haven't taken it, it's still open, it's free, it's paid for by the Flemish government, you needn't worry, and you can still take it, it's 10 to 15 minutes, and it helps you to know yourself better and how to better eloquently put forward your job expectations to mentors, coaches, your access, cost, anybody that, that might help you find your way to the right job. Recruiters, or if you're on a job, colleagues, hiring managers, the people where you do the periodic review with, etc., etc. So as, as Bala uh, said, um, the focus uh, was asked by the Flemish government to, to focus, they funded that, to focus on four key verticals. So that's the start. Of course, we want to expand it. We're integrating the, the technology and job boards across the world. Uh, a lot of corporations and HR services companies are already working with us. But this was the focus for the, uh, for the assignment at hand. So biotechnology, biology, chemistry and materials, both on the talent side, PhDs and postdocs, and corporate job opportunities in Flanders. But I think we can use them as a proxy, eh? and that, that might be a topic of conversation, a topic of discussion later if you, if you disagree, uh, might, might well be a good proxy for the rest of the Western world, to be seen. And just to, to keep it light and not too long, we're just going to focus on the work values now, and the, and the dichotomy, the gap between talent and jobs uh, with regards to the work values, the job content. Uh, an example of which I just gave, the planning autonomy, which is part of ambition, the work value ambition. And what we have done, and I'm going to quickly cycle through a couple of graphs, um, because you're an audience that, that uh, I think uh, is expected to, to, to handle data and interpret graphs, so uh, this will make everything very clear. What we plotted there is for a very big sample size of PhDs and postdocs on the one hand, and jobs on the other hand, the top two work values of six. So what are the most important aspects that you're looking for in a job? And what are the most important aspects that the job offers to you from a job content perspective? Okay, 
let's start. Eh? It's in alphabetical order, the four verticals on the talent side. Start with the biotechnology PhDs and postdocs as an introduction just to get us, get us going. What you see is that near to 70% of PhDs and postdocs, and that was, that was striking, uh, that's, that's literally off the charts. That's the highest. We've, we've been doing this research since, two, since 2014. We've never seen this. This is something that I was, I was shocked of. Um, I'm not a researcher. I, I, I might have looked upon you wrongly. I would never have expected that level of ambition, let alone that among PhDs and postdocs, that it would have been the highest, even higher than, let's say, economics majors, uh, highly educated graduates or, or creative profiles or something. No, it's the highest, highest that we've ever seen. And that, that's a red thread. So, what you see uh, when we start adding the insights into the other verticals, what, what they expect is that um, the ambition keeps up. We'll, we'll get into it and we'll also, I will also can go back to it if you have questions about it, but I, I'd like to, to save some time for, for Q&A um, as well. And these are the naked figures, but there are a couple of things that Bala and I decided to, to highlight also to get a conversation going and to get us to talk and to think about it. So first, obviously, uh, it's, it's the ambition. Um, it's across the board of the charts. That's, that's, that's crazy, literally. On the other hand, where, where there's a lot of differentiation between the verticals, between the different vocations, between the different domains, it's regard, with regards to the work value harmonious. Now, what does that mean? That means if, you're, if your expectation is that you want to work in a harmonious work environment, it's with short decision lines, lots of people around you, lots of feedback, lots of feedback opportunities, lots of soundboards. That's something you see eh, is, can be hugely different. For example, eh, in the materials cohort, less than 15%. And in the biotechnology cohort, half of the people are looking for a type of job that caters to those expectations. So those were the, th the two things that we, just as an introduction, that we wanted to highlight. Now we'd like uh, to, to close it up, uh, the, the, the presentation of the interim results. We'd like to focus on two verticals and talk about the gap between the expectations of the talent side, PhDs and postdocs researchers, and the corporate side. We have chosen biotechnology and chemistry because they are two the most, most striking, the most telling examples. Let's start with biotechnology. Um, in biotechnology, the very good news is if you as a PhD, a postdoc, a researcher are able to express your expectations, and for example, via uh, the Eurexis platform, get in touch with a lot of uh, potential employers. If you just cycle through enough of them in a short period of time, you're bound to find the job that suits your needs. Uh, that's, that's the good news. One thing with regards to ambition, I've told it a couple of times how off the charts it is, employers aren't ready for that. That's the bad news. But it might be that it's expectations management, that it has to come from two sides, that you might need to be able to bite the bullet. Ask for perspective. When is my ambition catered to? Ambition is by, about learning on the job, variation, planning autonomy, and career opportunities that you get at the employer. Four factors are behind the ambitious. That's something that you can put up front and force the employer to explain to you what the opportunities are at the company because there, there is a gap. Eh? You can't you can find it, but there might be perfect companies to work for where you first have to bite the bullet. You'll be catered to, to your ambition later. That's a good, that's, 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 just, that's a, I wouldn't say the good and the bad story. This, this one is very complex. Let's, let's call it that way. Um, Corporate chemistry jobs for PhDs and postdocs, getting out of research into companies, are primarily very 
procedure driven. And I asked a couple of uh, companies about that and they said, yeah, first they have to learn the ropes. Like a junior would need to learn the ropes here. So the, the freedom you might have had in the research context, it, you, get a bit, you get a bit hamstrung. That, that's a huge expectations gap that you need to bridge if you don't want to succumb to the, to the problem of wanting to leave the job in the first year, thinking the grass is greener with another company where you're almost as likely to encounter the same problem. It's all about perspective, about expectations management. Of course, perhaps the companies could do something, but that might be harder. But especially the gap with regards to ambition is the widest of all the four verticals. So especially for, for, for PhDs and postdocs, in chemistry we can, all, we can only advise, eh, use a CASI expectation scan, and eloquently put forward your expectations and try to find comfort before engaging in the employment. It's not a long process. It's one conversation, a good conversation with a recruiter, with a hiring manager, etc., etc. So to sum it up, last slide. Uh, we would love to bridge the expectations gap between PhDs and postdocs and, and the corporate world together with you. So if you're interested in, in working with the MCAA, with CASI, or with the both of us together, please reach out. Um, if you haven't, please do identify your expectations up front at the portal we created together, mcaa.casi.be slash talent. If you want to try out, yeah, not try out because then you would, uh, you would, you would create a dirty sample uh, uh, not not try out the job side, but if you do, if if you if you have someone um, on the job side that wants to fill it out, it's slash job. Uh, but this is this is really for the for for the for the talent. Also, the presentation to you. That's one to reveal your expectations early on to mentors, recruiters, managers, and also your colleagues on the job, and. What's very clear, and that's an advice already, eh, a bit, a bit avant, avant la lettre, a bit very early, because still interim results, but they, they show something. Please focus on the career path beyond the initial one, beyond the first step. Otherwise, you might well get disappointed, and it's not something the companies can solve easily, because for, eh, in some companies we've been told, hey, even, the job descriptions for jobs for postdocs and, and PhDs are written by legal people in the United States of America. We can't do anything about it in the short run. We have to bite the bullet together. Voila, that's our story. Um, I, I hope you liked the presentation and I'll leave the floor open for questions together with Bala. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. I've never heard of that before, so it's very impressive, and I can't wait to actually hear more. Um, I'm kind of talking more now from like the personal perspective. I would love to do the test, but I'm nor a PhD or a postdoc, so I could not do that because. Oh, okay, perfect. I, yeah, I would be really interested. <laughs> Thank you. By, by, judging by your accent, we're opening a New York office in two months as well. So, <laughs> yeah. I'm in DC, so hey. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for your interest. Thank you very much. I found it really interesting, and I was wondering along the way, did you already uh, confront, uh, for example, employers with this gap? Did you have a chance to show them the results, or what do you expect actually? What the effect could be when sharing these results yeah. to both communities? Thank you. I'm going to be very honest. Uh, it was quicker to make the presentation than deciding how to frame the results even today without any employers or sector federations here. Because you don't want to throw, uh, as, as they say in Dutch, the child away with the bathwater. Um, I think, yeah, if, if you approach it correctly and if you don't pass blame to either side but take a constructive approach and understand, uh, it's, it's, especially in chemistry, in large corporations, it's a high yeah, 
legal driven high risk environment where you first need to get to learn the ropes and the procedures so the answer is yes and no eh? we, we 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 are talking to them about it but it's a difficult conversation not that they don't want to change it because but because they realize it's a longer process than that we all as consumers of jobs would like because we're accustomed to being catered to our needs in almost real time in other business to consumer markets and the and in the job market this is hard but it's a very good question thank you for that but i'm looking forward to to working together on that as well to to see how we can build bridges it's all about communications and expectations management so thank you Just a question really out of curiosity, actually. So I, I saw in your, your slide basically that in all four sectors, results-oriented was a relatively um, fewer represented uh, orientation. Is it because uh, this is in general just not such a common uh, orientation? Or um, is it because of the background of the researchers? Or maybe because we're talking about academics? Or maybe people in business and finance would have more results-oriented orientation? I don't, maybe you don't know, and that's also fine. Uh, but uh, just in general, out of curiosity, uh, is this just uh, not so common? Or It's a bit lower than in the creative um, domains. But, but it's not something that's, that's otherwise that's off the charts. What's, what's, um, what's very striking is that ambitious is so high here. Uh, in some of the other um, uh, contexts, uh, harmonious sometimes is higher, accurate sometimes is higher, but the results oriented might be a bit higher, but it's not just, just in the creative sectors. That, that's why I focused on the ambitious part that we discussed that Thank you. Uh, maybe I, I lost s an information. Are we talking here about the, the type of job, right? Yes. We're not talking about the person. No, no, no. These, okay. these are the persons. So they have, they have been... Two yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so two surveys, two different surveys. Okay. And what is the corporation offering? Okay. In the job. That's basically it. So, but I don't see the second dimension. So, what is the corporation here? Yeah. yeah. This, this is four times the talent. Okay. This is talent and corporation. Okay. So you mean that the corporation is searching for less ambitious and more accurate people? Yeah, it would be dangerous. Yeah, I, okay. I, 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 I don't. It, no, no, it, no. it will not go out from this no, room. No, but, <laughs> but, but are looking for are able right now to cater to the ambition mm. of PhDs and postdocs at a level that would be perfect to make the PhDs and postdocs. Got it. Mm. Well, that's Thank you. Thank you. Sergio, any other questions? Oh, yeah. <coughs> okay, yeah, thank you also from my side. Um, I was wondering if it's an issue for you to go um, to go deeper into the corporates. So, for instance, if I think pharmaceutical company, um, there could be jobs in regulatory affairs relevant for postdocs and PhDs, but also in research. And I guess the the profile would be very different, right? Absolutely. And you're you're so right. And we we haven't been able to to do that yet, eh? because funds scale buy-in of parties like you. If we if we could if we could get that we could we could expand the scale and start to differentiate. You're absolutely right. This is just a tag, eh? a tagging mechanism to very easily do cluster analysis, do meta analysis on on which companies. And the way we envision the future is like ever since I I, I had kids, 
now I look eh, when you when you have the brochures to find travel options you look at the icons which say kid clubs I was never interested in that icon I truly believe that this could be something imagine a job fair or a job board that's how job boards are using us if you're a PhD and a postdoc up oh, there are jobs for these types of person at the company hey just click here and then a whole range of options open absolutely you're absolutely right because there is no single employer brand that can convey all the myriad options that are available within the different domains within the companies absolutely right great question another question or perhaps when we when we have the panel discussion okay i'm okay I'm I'm terribly sorry for that. But anyway, thanks very much to all the speakers.